Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2. Now, this is the beginning of the church, the New Testament church, I should say. And uh, I'm assuming one of these waters up here is mine. Well, they're all glass. Oh, those are plastic. Gotcha. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know, I got kind of excited at worship this morning. I try to keep myself quiet a little bit because I know I got to preach, but I couldn't, I just couldn't. There's some good stuff going on this morning. Amen. I'm not going to let a rock cry out in my place. Come on, somebody. Are you in Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. What we see here is we see what the believers began to do that had given their life to Christ after Peter stood up and preached and there were several thousand people that were saved. And we see here how the new church was formed. And I've got a title above verse 42. My title says, The Believers Form a Community. The Believers Form a Community. And this is the scripture that we're going to be reading in verse 42. All the believers, say all, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Verse 43, in a deep sense of all, this is the New Living Translation, a deep sense of all, okay, came over them all. And apostles performed many miracles, miraculous signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. This morning, I want to bring to you a message called devotion. Devotion is one of those subjective words, because devotion to me would probably mean something different than devotion to you. Amen? Amen? What I would consider to be devotion might be different than what you would consider to be devotion. This is what makes the Word of God so important in our life because we need to let the Word of God declare what devotion looks like. Amen? If I declare what devotion looks like or you declare what devotion looks like, our devotion might not look like what God wants it to look like. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. So what we do is we allow the Word of God to declare what devotion looks like. And so what we see here this morning, it says that they, all believers, what did they do? They what? They devoted themselves. The King James Version says it this way, that they continued steadfastly. The title again this message this morning is called Devotion. What? is your devotion. Again, the King James, the New King James Version says and uses the term continued steadfastly. We've already read the New Living. The New Living said that they devoted themselves. But the one that I really prefer the most because it's the most accurate of what it's depicting is the New American Standard, the NASB. And this is how it reads. It says they were continually devoting themselves. So it wasn't just a one-time devotion. It was a continual thing. It wasn't something that they got excited about once and did for six months and then backed off. It was a continual devotion. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' what? Teaching. Well, what were they teaching? Today, that would be the Word of God. Amen? So they devoted themselves to the Word of God. They devoted themselves to fellowship, right, to the breaking of bread. That would be the Lord's Supper, the the communion that we we share. And what else did they they devote themselves to? To prayer. So there's three things that we can see that there needs to be devotion. If you're a new believer or you're a a mature believer or you're a uh, just whatever, young, old, doesn't matter, teenager in the Lord, it doesn't matter. This is the devotion you should have. This is how they started. This is the example that they gave. 
because I want you to see something very, very uh, much so that needs to be seen. And, and it's this. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the Word of God, to fellowship, which is the coming together as a church, right? And to prayer. Now, when they did this, look at verse 43. When they did this, what happened? Everyone kept feeling, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. It means fear came up over everyone. Now, I'm not talking about a scared fear. I'm talking about a reverential fear. Amen? Fear came upon everyone. And what happened when fear came upon, when they began to reverentially fear the Word of God, when they began to fear and, and, and fear the Lord, and, and that sense of awe came up over them, what happened? Miraculous what? Remar miraculous signs and wonders took place. Amen? So if we want to see the things that God, if, if we want to see these miracles, these signs and these wonders happen among us, then I believe that we need to be devoted. We need to be devoted to the Word of God. We need to be devoted to fellowship. We need to be devoted to prayer. Amen? And so the NASB, I love what it says. It says they were continually devoting themselves. One thing that I really felt the Lord laid upon my heart as I was preaching this is many people in today's society, uh, we are so prone to instant gratification. I mean, we just, we want everything right now. You know, I mean, I can go on Amazon, no kidding, and order something on Amazon and it'll be on my doorstep Monday morning. I mean, that's almost quicker than going to the store. I mean, understands what I'm saying. And if we don't get it within two or three days, we're mad. What's up, man? Well, it only came from Hong Kong. I mean, you got to give a couple of days for flight, okay? I mean, yeah. are, you, are, you, are you understanding what I'm saying? How many of us have gotten short because our meal didn't come out fast enough when we're at the restaurant? Or the lady at the checkout stand didn't check us out quick enough? You should have been back in the day when I was a young guy. When I was a young guy and you went to the grocery store, this is what you saw. Oh, item one. Now they just scan it. Zoop, zoop. Man, when they did that, I thought, man, they shouldn't even get paid for that. I'm just, hey, I, you hear what I'm saying? That's pretty easy. But now that's not fast enough. Uh, come on now. Now that's not quick enough. We just want to walk in. Y'all seen the commercials where the guy just walks in, pecks up a few things, and walks through the scanner and says, see ya, and it just checks him out as he's walking through. That's messed up. But basically what it speaks to is to no human interaction. And one thing I want to, I, be, I really feel the Lord wants, the point that he wants to get across today is that this life, this relationship with God, is not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. Okay, it's cross-country. It takes time. It takes dedication. It takes devotion. We can't come and give our life to the Lord on Monday and have all of our hopes and dreams on Friday fulfilled. And that's where I believe a lot of people miss the things of God. They quit, watch this, they quit right before their blessing. The devotion's not there. Well, I expected to see something happen in my life within a month. I expected to see something happen in my life within three months or six months. You know, I expected to see this and that. And, and I don't have time to get into this type of a message, but the reality is, is there's a reason why you don't see those things as quick as you think you should see them. And I don't have a time to get into that, but it's called Jesus being Lord. And Jesus knowing what you need more than what you think you need. And, and, and it has to do with trusting him. Are you understanding? This is not a hundred yard dash. It's a marathon. You need to trust the Lord. And so there needs to be some devotion because there's going to be some things that he doesn't do that you don't understand. And the only thing that's going to keep you through is your devotion. The only thing that's going to hold you to the path of this relationship is devotion. It's trust. Come on now. It's faith. I believe God has my best interest at mine. I'm going to keep my devotion at the level it needs to be at. 
I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to draw back. I'm going to go strong. So we see here it's a steadfast. The New King James used the word a continued steadfastness. Well, when you look that word up, it basically means this. It means attend constantly. Attend constantly. Continually devoting themselves. Persistent. Keep on with devotion. Faithful. Last week we talked about faithfulness, didn't we? So it's being faithful to the things of God. So I have a few points I want to bring to you this morning. One, the adversary of progression is stagnation. The adversary of progression is stagnation. There are so many people that are what I call they're stuck in a rut. They're not moving forward. They're not going anywhere. They go home, go to work, sleep, wake up, go to home, go to work, sleep, wake up, go home, go to work, sleep, wake up. Amen? I don't know about you, but my father-in-law used to say it this way. A rut is nothing more than a grave with two ends kicked out of it. You know, we get stuck in this, in this mode, and we get stuck in this way of thinking, which is not right. We get stuck in this way of living, which is not right. And the only thing that's going to pull you through that is devotion. That's what will pull you through that. Devotion, faithfulness, being faithful to the things of God. So many people never see the victories in their life that they really want to see because they're not devoted. They'll try something for a month. They'll try something for six months. They'll try something. I had somebody say to me one time, I, and I'll st I still say this to this day. If you do something that I tell you to do, and you do it for a year, and your life doesn't drastically change in that year, I mean drastically change in that year, I'll put the microphone down and I'll never preach another sermon as long as I live. I put that out. I do it all the time. And this is what I say. If you devote yourself to just coming to church, listen to what I'm saying. When the doors are open, come to church and take the word that was said and meditate on it. If you do that for a year, one year, if your life is not drastically changed, I'll put the microphone down and I'll never preach another word as long as I live. I had a lady come up to me in Friona. This is, and I, I said that all the time. And I still, I haven't made that statement in a while, but it's still true. I still make it. And this lady came up to me. She goes, well, it looks like you don't, you need to stop preaching. And I said, really? How come? Well, I, I did what you said, and my life wasn't drastically changed. And I said, well, if I remember correctly, I remember when you were in, the, when you started coming to the church, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, you were pretty strong there for about three months, but then all of a sudden, you dropped off the face of the planet. I never saw you in church. I said, if you remember what I said, is I said, you need to devote yourself to coming to church and taking what was preached and meditate on it. Your life would change. Did you do that? Well, not, not, eh, 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 wrong answer. Did you do that? Well, I had eh, wrong answer. You know, excuses is like elbows. Everybody's got two. I'm not trying to be harsh this morning, but we can all make our own what? We can all make our own excuses for not doing what we need to be doing. And so I said, no. No, you didn't keep up your end of the bargain. Start coming to church. Take the Word of God. Meditate on it. And then let's do that solid for a year and then come to me. Never saw her again. See, people want the idea of change, but they don't want the discipline of it. It sounds good to them to be set free. It sounds good to them to be delivered from all the mind things that go on in their mind. But they don't realize the one thing that comes against your mind is saying that's the only way he can battle you. It's like Joyce Myers' famous book, it's the battlefields in the mind. 
Well, the only thing you can battle that is to put stuff in your mind. That's it in a nutshell. You've got to put the Word of God in your mind. You've got to meditate upon it. Psalms 1, he who meditates upon the Word of God and meditates upon it what? Day and night. Will be like what? A tree planted by the river's water who does not wither, who gives leaves in, in season, right? Who gives fruit in season and whatever, say whatever, whatever he does will what? Prosper. But are you meditating day and night? What's your devotion to the Word of God? It amazes me how many people... Oh, I'm getting on a soapbox. Let's move on. All right. The adversary of progression is stagnation. Progression is to proceed, to develop, to move gradually towards or a more advanced state. To move towards a more advanced state. Progression. We all need to progress in the things of God. Can somebody say amen? We all need to move forward in our relationship with God. There needs to be progression. What's the opposite of progression? Stagnation. Standing still. Not moving. What does the word stagnation mean? It means this. The state of not moving. <laughs> it's pretty simple. If you don't move, if you don't do something, you're going to become what? Stagnant. You'll come stagnant in your relationship. You'll come stagnant in your workplace. You'll come stagnant in everything in life. You'll become stagnant because what? You see things the same way every day, every day, every day, every day. This is the way it is, this is the way it is, this is the way it is. Well, here's the problem with that. It's the way you see it. That's the way you see it. I'm at a dead-end job. That's the way you see it. I've had so many people, I had a, I used to manage a restaurant. I'll, I'll just tell you, I managed a, a McDonald's one time. And this young lady kept coming to me and, and, and wanting a raise, but never would do the things that would justify getting. And I couldn't get this through her understanding. I'm doing my job. And that's what we pay you to do. A raise means you've gone above and beyond what we pay you to do. Time on a job does not justify raise. Many of you disagree with that because you've never been a manager. You've never been on the other side. See, if you continue to do the same thing, what would cause someone to want to give you a raise to do the same thing that you've always done? It's the ones who do the extra mile. They go up, up. They get noticed. I was at McDonald's, and I made a decision. I don't want to be the one flipping the burgers all the time. So I became the best. I mean, you can even ask Tammy. I was the, everybody wanted me to work on their shift. Everybody did. Because I was the fastest, I was the cleanest, and I got my job done, and I got it quick, done quickly than anybody else in that store. So I went what? Above and beyond flipping burgers. And all of a sudden, the manager started noticing. This guy has ambition. This guy is not going to stay the same. He's got innovation. He's got a thought process. I could close the grill down in literally, I could close the grill down in 15 minutes. Cleaned, steamed, everything, 15 minutes. It took normal people 45 minutes to an hour. That's what you do to get raises. It's moving forward. It's progression. It's going above and beyond. So it may... What I've seen in this level, the Lord has blessed me to have these jobs where I could see people in the same position and see one grow and move on and one never move. And they always ask, come to me and ask, well, why didn't I get a raise? Why didn't I get a promotion? Why, we've got, we both got hired at the same time. Why are they moving up and I'm standing here? Because you're still standing here. You're not moving forward. You're not trying to be the best at your job that you can be. The only thing you're doing is what we've asked you to do. I don't know why I'm getting into this this morning. I really don't. This isn't on my message. 
But maybe somebody needs to hear it. And it's the same thing with our relationship with God. We expect God just to open himself up in all of his splendor and wonder to us, which he has done, and promote us in every area of our life when we don't move. Why would he, why would he pour out all of his uh, blessing that he has planned for your life and give it all to you right here when you're not doing anything? You're not, you're not moving forward in it. You're not doing anything. It's always been about you. I'm always hurting. I'm always in pain. I'm always this. I'm a, it's like what Joyce Meyer said. I love quoting Joyce Meyer. I don't know why, but she's got some good things. Y'all have seen the What About Me robot, right? And, and that's the mode we get into. Hebrews 10.38 says, My righteous ones will live by what? Faith. But I take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. Look at that. When we turn away from God, when we don't stay devoted, look, faith is moving and stepping out on something when there's nothing there. And see, what that means is that's what I did. I didn't have any promotion uh, guaranteed me. Nobody told me I was going to get a raise. Nobody t- I just said, you know what, I'm going to do the work and I'm going to expect the best I can expect. I stepped out in faith. I said, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna believe that somebody's gonna see me. I'm gonna believe that somebody's gonna recognize my work, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna be happy doing it. So I walk in with a smile on my face. I'm happy. I'm thanking God. Look, let me tell you something. I know flipping burgers might not be the greatest job in the world, but at least you won't go hungry. Come on, somebody say amen. It's all about our mental attitude. And how we take, I I guarantee there's somebody that would love to have your job. Somebody's out there saying, you don't know what I do. Well, I'll tell you, you've never been to India. You've never seen people pick stuff and trash off the streets on an alarming rate. They would love to do what you do for what you get paid for doing it. It's all about perspective, my friend. It's all about perspective. We don't draw back. We constantly move forward. We constantly, we are devoted to God. I might not see everything I want to happen, but I'm going to continue to press on. I might not see everything that takes place that I want to play, take place, but I'm not going to give up on God. I'm not going to give up on what he, what he, or the plan that he has for me. I know what his plan is for me, says Jeremiah 29, 11. His plan is to prosper me, to bring me a hope and a future, and I'm not giving up on that. Can somebody say amen? I'm going to stay devoted. I'm not going to draw back and shrink back to my own destruction. I'm going to keep moving forward because God has no pleasure. And let me tell you something. When something's moving, watch this. Thank you, God. That was awesome. I didn't have this down either. When you're standing still and something's moving forward, you're now going backwards. I'm going to say that again. If I'm standing here and something's flying by me, I'm now going backwards. And we have so many people that are just standing still in the things of God. And God says, get up, move. What did he tell, what did, what did he tell Joshua? What did he tell Joshua? What did the Spirit of the Lord tell Joshua? Now, get up, move. My servant Moses is dead. Now, get up. It's time to take these, 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 these people across the, the Jordan. It's time to move. Folks, there's, for some of you this morning, it's time to move. Amen? Ephesians 4, 21, 23 says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, watch this, throw off all the old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by the lust and deceptions. Instead, say instead. Instead, let the Spirit, let the Spirit, capital S, let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Man, we just need to wake up. You know, I like what, um, I like what Kenneth Hagin used to say. You just need to wake up and laugh at the devil. Ha, 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 ha. You want to put that on me? Ha, 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 ha. 
Now, you might look at me and think, man, he's an idiot. Yeah, but I'm a joyful one. I'm happy. I'm not depressed. I'm not upset. I'm not angry. I'm not mad. I love waking up in the morning. Come on, somebody. I, I, I walk around with a smile on my face. It's like what they say to Jesse. Somebody give them, I'm going to wipe that smile off your face. And Jesse looked at him and said, your toilet paper ain't that thick. You see what I'm saying? We have a choice. Look what the scripture said. It said for you, since you, say me, since I have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, I, say I, need to throw off the old sinful nature, the former way of life, which is corrupted by the lust and the deception. Instead, I need to let the Spirit renew my thoughts and my attitudes. Woo! Come on, somebody. I'm not going to think the same way. I'm not going to act the same way. I'm not going to do the same way. I'm happy. I like what testimony that uh, Sis gave in one of our classes. She gra she's grabbed a hold of this. Ali's grabbed a hold of this. And she said her boss, if I, I, I might be butchering it, but her boss is like, man, you are, you're different. She said, that's right. I am different. You're happy, you're joyful, you're smiling, yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. She works hard. She has a job she goes to every day. She has five children that she has to put food on the table for, and God blesses her every day. Good job. That's dedication. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit, I'm not going to stop, and I'm not going backwards. And let me tell you, friend, she's had plenty of opportunities to go backwards. Because she shared them with us. Had plenty of opportunities to go backwards. But you know what? God is my life. And I'm going to stay devoted to him. Can somebody say amen? And the only way you can do that is let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. And that's why... I'm going to move into this next point. How do we do that? We must make the decision to change. We must make the decision to change. Acts 2, 42 and 43 says this. They were continually devoted. Say continually devoted. They continually devoted themselves to the teaching of the word, the fellowship, and to prayer. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Word of God. The first thing they did is they devoted themselves to the Word of God. James 1.21 says, so get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives. Get rid, that's you. Get rid of all that stuff in your life by the help of the Holy Spirit, by the way. We've already, we've already talked about that. All of this can't be done in your own strength. You need the help of God. That's why, like Dee said, you've got to wake up every morning and get a fresh anointing for the struggles that you're going to face that day. Can somebody say Amen. You need to wake up every morning and say, good morning, Holy Spirit. I'm going to need you today, by the way. Because <laughs> I know I'm going to step in something. I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm not going to do a negative confession, but I'm just going to sit here and say, you know what? The devil is going to come at me because the Word of God says he is. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he what? May devour. But he don't know I got a secret weapon, and it's called the Holy Spirit, and he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. Come on, somebody. And I've also got him living in me. So now that means the things that Jesus Christ done, it says in John 14, 12, the things that he's did on this earth, I can do those things and even greater because he's in me. So it's me and you, Holy Spirit. Come on now. And I'm going to tell you what. When you've got the Holy Spirit on your side, there's nothing you can't conquer. But what builds that up on the inside of you? It is staying in the Word of God. It's staying devoted in the Word of God. Humbly accepting the Word that God has planted in your heart. For it has the power to save your soul. You need to stay dedicated to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 said, And all of us, 
as with unveiled faces. This is the amplified version. Because we continued, we continued to behold in the word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are constantly being transfigured into his very own image in every increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. How did that happen? Because they continually, with unveiled faces, continued to behold the Word of God. They kept the Word of God before their face. Amen? Right here. This is where it stayed. And they devoted themselves to it. That's how you reach that place. Next is fellowship. Fellowship. Hebrews 10.25 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage, encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There, there I believe, and I'm, I'm saying this, and I want everybody to hear what I'm saying. I believe the number one attacked thing today that Satan is attacking is the local church. And I'm just, I'm just going to tell you what I've observed over, over the years. The local church does not hold the standing in people's lives that the local church used to hold. People put the local church, uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm a pastor. I'm just telling you this is, this is the word of God. I wasn't raised in church. A matter of fact, a lot of this has come from Tammy because she grew up in church. I didn't. And so she remembers what church used to be like. What people, how, what people used to put the priority that used to be put, that's the best way to say that, the priority that used to be put on the church. Now, the reason that's happened, it could be many things. It could be because there's a lot of pastors that have fallen. There's a lot of pastors that have made mistakes. There's people that's gotten hurt by churches. I understand that. But let me tell you something that the Lord gave me uh, many years ago because I got so frustrated at people that continually would tell me that I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I've even had people leave this church because I made that statement. Because they felt so strongly that I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And they left the church because of that statement. But what many don't understand is this, that we are called the bride of Christ. Jesus is coming back for his bride without spot or wrinkle. Now listen to what I'm saying. If we are the bride of Christ and you go to God and say, God, I love you, but I can't stand your bride. How is that going to go over? I'm just asking a simple question. Many of you men today, what if you had a good buddy and the love of your life is st sitting next to you? And your buddy says, hey, I'd like to come and hang out with you, but why don't you come to my house because I can't stand your wife. How would that go over? Well, if you have a wife like mine, the dude just lost his teeth. Now he needs to see a dentist. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That was, just, that was a couple of weeks ago. Tammy's delivered from that now. Um, Amen. Hallelujah. I, trust me, I am what I am today because of her. I mean that in a good way. <laughs> but we've lost the concept of church. Why have we lost the concept of church? Satan wants you to lose the concept of church. Because the Word of God says several, many, 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 many places. That scripture right there. Do not neglect coming together. Why? Because you are not created to do life alone. We help out one another. We bless one another. You can't be who God's called you to be without a body of believers surrounding you. You can't be what you need to be by yourself. Just one quick thought here. How can you be who you need to be, which is a blessing? God's called all of us to be a blessing, right? He's blessed you with gifts. He's blessed you with anointings. Okay, how do you operate in those by yourself? So I'm going to read you a couple of things. The first one is 1 Corinthians. I mean, excuse me. 
Hebrews. Right? Let us not neglect. That's one scripture. This is a book I bought called Why Church Matters by Joshua Harris. And I'm going to read you a little chapter, just a little bit of excerpt out of this book. It's a fantastic book. And this is what he says. Thinking globally and loving locally is the title. A local church is a visible, tangible, real-world expression of the body of Christ. Of course, every believer is part of the universal church, writes Chuck Colson. But for any Christian who has a choice in the matter, failure to cleave to a particular church is failure to obey Christ. Charles Spurgeon, many of you know that name, went down as one of the most fantastic preachers in the world, agreed that for a Christian, failure to join a church is disobedience. He combined piercing truth and humor when he compared such disconnected Christians to good-for-nothing bricks. I picked this for Daryl. Because when I, thought, when I read this, I thought of Daryl right off the bat. Look what it says. I know there are some to say, well, I have given myself to the Lord, but I do not intend to give myself to the church. Why not? Because I can be a Christian without it. Are you quite clear about that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to your Lord's commands as being obedient? That's a question. What is a brick made for? To help build a house. It is of no use for the brick to tell you that it is just a good a brick while it is kicking about on the ground as it would be in the house. It is a good-for-nothing brick. Listen to this. So you Rolling Stone Christian. This is Charles Spurgeon. This is the statement he made. I do not believe that you are answering your purpose. You are living contrary to the life which Christ would have had you live. And you are much to blame for the injury you do. Only by joining a local church can Christians avoid kicking about on the ground like a brick. It's in the local church that we are attached to God's work around the world. Folks, I believe that people wake up and immediately, immediately Satan hits them. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to do this. You don't have to get involved. You don't have to do this. Let me ask you a question. If, if, that, if, if the local church was not so powerful, listen to what I'm saying, then why is people constantly trying to come against the local church? If it wasn't so powerful, then why are you always attacked by not going? Why is Satan always telling you you don't have to come? I want you to think about that. And, 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 and here's, here's, here's the rest of, of what I want to say. Ephesians 4.11. Now these are gifts that were given to the local church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Can I ask you a question? If Christ did not believe in or ordain the local church, then why did he give the gift of pastor? I'm going to say that again. If he did not ordain the local church, then why did he give the five-fold ministry gift? Pastor is one of them. If he didn't intend the church to be a, a, a mighty force in the world, then why did he give the gift of pastor? Why didn't he just leave that off? It's quiet in here this morning. Ephesians 4.12 their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the body of Christ, the body of Christ. That's what the church is for, till we all come to such unity of faith, right? And if you have your word, I want to I show you one more thing concerning the fellowship. 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, 1 and 7. I want to show you a scripture here. That when I read it, when the Lord showed it to me, I actually had already had my sermon finished, completed, and done. And it was in my devotions uh, one morning 
uh, I think it was Saturday morning, that the Lord gave me this scripture in the middle of my devotion and said, I want you to add this to your sermon. So I had to come back and add this. But this is what he says in 1 John 1, 7. Are you there yet? Say amen. All right, 1 John 1, 7. Look what he says. Okay, I'm going to start with verse 5. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Verse 7. But, say but. If we are living in the light, if, I, I, I just feel like we need to, if you are living in the light. Say, if I am living in the light. If I'm living in the light, then I will have fellowship with one another. Watch this. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, will cleanse me from all sin. I don't know about you, that's pretty powerful. If, if, I'm, if, if I'm in the light, I will have fellowship. If I'm in the light, I will have fellowship. And so we can... We can we can believe all the lies that the enemy wants to tell you about coming to church. We can believe all the lies about how I don't have to be there and I don't have to go in hell. I don't have to. You can believe all the lies, but let me tell you something. God will hold you accountable how you treated his church. Guaranteed. Because he died for the church. He gave his life for the church. And it's, he ordained it and put gifts in it to help who? You. That's like going to the doctor, my friend, and listening to nothing he has to say to you. Come on, somebody. It's a big if, isn't it? This verse is saying if we walk in the light, then two things will follow. We will have fellowship, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us. And the final thing I want to close with is prayer. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray all times, on every occasion, in every season. In the spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and, per and perseverance. Interceding in behalf on all the saints. God's consecrated people. We are to pray always. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Be unceasing in your prayer. Praying perseveringly. 1 Samuel 12, 23 says, prayerlessness is a sin. Moreover, 1 Samuel 12, 23, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Let me tell you, powerlessness is prayerlessness. When you don't pray and stay connected to God, let me tell you something. God takes note of that. Friend, what am I talking about here this morning? I'm talking about three things that every believer should do to stay devoted to Jesus Christ. Fellowship, prayer, and the Word. And those are the three things. If you devote yourself to those three things, if you devote yourself, your life will never be the same. Are you tired of hearing testimonies of everybody, how God's blessing all these other... Are you tired of hearing how all these people are blessed and all these things are just going right? Great, then just increase your devotion level. Come on, get in the Word of God. Get into prayer. I remember one time I got so tired of everybody saying, boy, we just need an old-time revival. We just need an old-time revival. Boy, we need one of those old-time revivals. And I got tired of hearing it. I really did. And I said, Lord, I'm really tired of hearing this. I don't even know what an old-time revival looks like. I didn't get saved. I mean, I wasn't saved until I was 19, 20. I, I wasn't raised in the church. Tammy knows what an old-time revival is. I didn't know what one looked like. And the Lord spoke to me, and he goes, well, just tell them this. If they want old time and revival, tell them they need to get back to the old time faith and commitment. I said, okay. I said that to one person. It's amazing how people quit saying that. Look, friend, I'm not telling you something. I'm not really railing anybody today, and I'm not trying to bring a negative word today. The point I'm trying to bring to you today is the reason we don't see the results that we're asking God to see is maybe because our devotion isn't what it needs to be. Maybe, just maybe. And so, 
My last point, and I'll ask the praise team to come. What happens when you stay devoted? What happens when you stay devoted? What do we see? Everyone in Acts 42, 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. The Amplified Version says it this way, and a sense of awe, reverential fear came upon everyone. When you stay devoted to the church and you stay devoted to fellowship, prayer, and the word, a sense of reverential awe will come upon you. And you'll have a respect. You'll have a reverential fear for the things of God. And when you come to a body of believers like this and you have that fear, that reverential fear in check, when you have that sense of awe and expectancy, when you have that, things begin to happen. God begins to move, and He begins to move on your behalf, and He begins to do things for you. And that's what we need to have, friend. This is what happens when our devotion... I have no problem with you coming to church on a Sunday morning and needing a little pump up. I don't have a problem with that. Sometimes I come to church, I need pumped up. Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about. Sometimes we've had bad weeks. Sometimes we've had bad days. And man, I just need to get pumped up a little bit. Come on now, I need the worship team to do their job. That's what we think sometimes, right? But what if? What if you pump yourself up? What if you get in your car? Like what my, I tell you, there's sometimes I know when Tammy's needing to pump up because I walk in the house and all she has is Toby Mac. Man, she loves Toby Mac. And I'll walk in there, and she's just da, 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 I'm not, singing Toby Mac. <laughs> going off through the house. Toby Mac, man, and boy, it just pumps her up, gets her going, man. Hallelujah. Whatever, whatever gets you going. But what if we all came to church, prayed up, read up, come on now, and ready to fellowship in the body of Christ. What kind of service would we have? Come on. The first thing you should think, first thing you should think of when you think of fearing the Lord is obedience. Psalms 25, 12, 13 says, Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity, and their children will inherit the earth. This all happens when you fear the Lord. What is fearing the Lord? Quickly, it's respecting His commands. It's refusing to get angry, bitter, Sometimes there's things in our life outside the church that can make us angry. I understand that. There's sometimes things in the church that can make us angry. But we refuse to do that. We walk in love. Because, why? Because the word commands it. We walk in love. We pray for, we uplift, and we encourage one another. Can I ask you, wouldn't it be so much easier to come and fellowship in a church like that? They don't care about your background, don't care about how many times you've messed up, don't care about how many times you've fallen away, don't care about how many times, all they care about is that you're here. Come on, somebody say amen. All they care about is, can I pray for you? All they care about is, can I hold you up? All they care about is, can I stand with you in prayer? Can I agree with you on something? You need, to, you need to see God move in your life? I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you. Come on, somebody. That's what we're here to do. That's why fellowship is so important. So I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. And if you need prayer for anything this morning, we want to pray for you. Acts 10.2 says this, a devout man. This is talking about Cornelius. Cornelius was a devout man. He was devoted. He was a devoted man. One who feared God. Do you see those two words together? He was devoted and he feared God with all his household. Watch this. And gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. 
And guess who was the first Gentile family, the first Gentile family to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit? It was Cornelius' household. Can somebody say amen? 